Hello and welcome back to Glasgow Truth Group Radio. Today we'll be speaking to Aaron Franz, creator of the now famous Age of Transitions film and author of the book Revolve, Man's Scientific Rise to Godhood. We discuss the concept of transhumanism, converging technologies, and the ever-increasing technological revolution that we find ourselves in today. Okay, so we're here with Aaron Franz today, and um, I thought probably the best thing, again, to, to start the show with is just if, if Aaron can tell us a little bit about um, himself and, and where he's uh, come from and, and how he's got into this kind of material, just for the people who might not know. Sure. Um, well... My website's The Age of Transitions. Um, it's, uh, the website's name is the same as my documentary film, The Age of Transitions. Uh, that's probably what people know best of what I've put out there. It's just an hour-long uh, documentary about transhumanism, about singularity and uh, eugenics and the connections there. And uh, I've also got a book called Revolve that gets into these subjects as well, and that's on theageoftransitions.com. Before that, I mean, it's been uh, a lifelong journey, as it is with everybody else. I just uh, found myself face-to-face with this information, um, whatever you want to call the information, the truth movement or whatever. You know, there's so many different ways to label whatever this is that we're doing, but I found myself uh, really getting deep into this stuff about four years ago and you know I've never turned back since and it's been quite a journey and I'm very excited to be here speaking with yourself because I know you're doing a very you're doing the same thing as, as me as we all are all the listeners too yeah that's right we've, we've obviously got a lot in common and that's um one of the reasons I was uh, really interested to to talk to you about these kinds of things um but perhaps for for people that don't um, don't know necessarily what transhumanism, transhumanism is, or maybe they've they've heard about it and they're, they're not really sure, um, you know, what it's all about and why we're talking about it. Do you think you could just give us a sort of a, in a nutshell, you know, kind of a quick rundown on, on what what transhumanism it transhumanism is and why it's um, why it's so important to talk about? Yes. Um, well, transhumanism is many things. The most uh, commonly accepted. Uh, definition of it now the uh, mainstream definition is that it is all about the creation of things high technologies such as artificial intelligence nanotechnology uh, developing life extension therapies um, cybernetics things like chips uh, brain chips of course these sort of things and how the creation of uh, those sorts of converging technologies um, would are is beneficial that we should be actively uh, creating these things and uh, applying them to our lives. And uh, the the transhumanist idea is that in doing this, this is the way to, uh, this is human progress. This is where we're going. This is the answer to evolution itself, actually. It's the way to take human evolution into human hands kind of expedite the slow natural process of evolution and put it on the fast track and with that uh, of of course the idea of transhumanism it is not new and it it comes out of uh, things like eugenics and even the idea of evolution is I mean there's there's so many concepts that this ties into but the the mainstream idea and and transhumanism is steadily going mainstream now is that it's all about these converging technologies and that we should basically become post-human beings by uh, becoming cybernetic organisms, putting all these technological upgrades, as they call them. Those are the words that they used to describe all these technologies as upgrades. So that's that's what they think we should be doing to evolve our human species. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> it's something you're seeing a lot of in, in mainstream media at the moment. Um, I mean, I'm sure people have noticed that, um, I mean, a lot of these big, big budget films of the last maybe sort of 10, 15, 20 years have, have been featured, uh, have been featuring quite a, quite a heavy use of um, these concepts, you know, where man is merging with machine or machine has overtaken man. Um, and they've they've been coming out on um, shows like Star Trek, you know, with the Borg. We've had you know Terminator Two and um, 
you know, there's been so many others. Like uh, more recently, we've we've had the Iron Man remakes, and then I mean, especially in the last kind of maybe maybe year to two years, there's been a huge kind of surge of films that have all featured this kind of human upgrade where humans take the next step and, and merge with machine and become Superman, you know? And um, a lot of this stuff I find tends to be directed towards towards the younger kids, you know, because a lot of these are kind of um, like uh, comic remakes and, um, and classic kind of hero movies, you know, Hollywood blockbuster hero movies. Um, so it, it seems as if they're, they're really trying to introduce these ideas to us um, in so many different areas. Um, in, in what's often referred to as predictive programming. Um, so, I mean, what would you what would you have to say about that? I mean, are there any sort of key movies that really stand out to you, or how, where do you see this going? Yes, you're absolutely right in saying that there is a huge plethora of transhumanist themed films at the moment. Of course, this isn't new. I mean, this is science fiction itself, but in the last couple of years, we have seen a big push, especially specifically with uh, transhuman technologies we can see specific things being promoted in specific movies like we've got artificial intelligence being promoted in films such as eagle eye for instance um yeah, yeah. very and and also the idea of like surveillance and government spying is very prevalent in that film and that film as with many many others about transhuman themes was produced uh with the help of the united states air force the military is very big in uh with their entertainment liaison offices and creating these films and you will find with the air force in particular that many um transhumanist themed films with artificial intelligence robots with uh the ais especially ai and robots it seems like the air force is big on uh because they also made the transformers films and uh again with the comic book films you mentioned comic books and they're making tons of them you'll notice too that with uh, most of those films they're actually about the military industrial complex like with iron man it's the creation of like this uh superman well, well it's a guy who has a military industrial company and you know that suit is like you know his weapon basically and then he becomes a superhero through his uh, military creation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with the Incredible Hulk. It's, you know, they're doing genetic tests on this guy. It's, it's um, again, it, and they're, they're quite overt with the military aspect of things. And they even put things like, uh, like high-tech weaponry they put in that Hulk film. They put like, uh, what was it, the sound cannons and things like that. So they put those elements in there as a bit of predictive programming as i'm sure all of your listeners are aware of the idea of pre- predictive programming because that's what these movies are but with the predictive programming it's working on multiple different levels all at once it's promoting the military first of all that's kind of the exoteric uh predictive programming for people just to ramp up military service and then you also have the promotion of, well, their weaponry just to get you in line, your mind in line with the fact that those things are real. And if you see them in real life at some point, um, well, don't be surprised. You know, we told you already. And yeah. also predictive programming with transhumanist themes telling you that, like, look, you know, you're going to be interacting with machines soon. So we're going to be putting the main characters uh they're going to be machines and you're going to see humans and machines basically falling in love on screen. And, uh, the, you're seeing that over and over and over again now in movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously that's, um, the big, the big, um, the whole point of, uh, predictive programming is to, to make the, the public feel like basically that it's inevitable, you know? So when these things do come into public domain and we start kind of interacting with them or we start, um, you know, seeing them in real life or, or what have you. Um, the, the idea of these films is, is to just to introduce those concepts so that, you know, when this happens, people have just assumed subconsciously that, oh, well, you know, it was inevitable. You know, we, you know I, I guess it was any way it could have gone, you know. And, um, and of course, um, I think another interesting point um, that you raised there is, is the Pentagon connection to Hollywood um, because... Um, 
basically, if, if you're making a film uh, and um, <clears throat> you need, uh, you know, uh, military assistance with it for, uh, you know, for planes and guns and soldiers and advice on explosions or what have you, um, you have to contact the, the Pentagon Liaison Office or I think, what, did you say the Air Force? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, each specific branch of the military has their own entertainment liaison office, as does the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and some other federal agencies. Yeah. That's right, because um, I think I think the basic um, the rules are there. As far as I understand them from kind of the the, the research I've done, is that um, if you if you want assistance from them, um, you you have to portray the film in a way that favors the military, or else you get nothing. You know, yeah. and uh, these guys will actually come and rewrite the script for you until they're satisfied that it portrays the mil- military and the military agenda in the most favorable favorable light possible. That's, that right? a, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, they actually, they have the ability to rewrite the script. They have the ability to create characters. They have the ability to change the story to however they want. And they do admit to an extent that, you know, yeah, we're trying to um, promote our military agenda, which exoterically, again, is a good thing. You know, yeah, our military is... It's the whole same old thing with um, how they legitimate wars, you know, like, oh, we're out there doing a good thing. You know, we have to be in Iraq. We have to be in Afghanistan. We have to be in, what is it, 150 countries? Oh, well, they barely ever tell you they're in that many countries. It's always a focus on one little country or another. But the truth is we're in the over, spread across the entire world. And the big propaganda push is to get us, the average people, to think that this is a good and wonderful thing and that we're... Uh, <laughs> enlightening the world that our military is some sort of in, enlightenment force to uh go bring democracy to the savages and whatnot so it's it's the same deal uh, with with films as well and yeah they get to they get to write in whatever they want <laughs> yeah yeah they, they really do um and obviously um we'll probably get into this a bit later on but um as we know uh most of this kind of uh you know, transhumanistic uh, te- technology. You know, the um, nanotechnology and biotechnology and, and and this kind of thing is coming from the military-industrial complex, isn't it? Yes, and that's a wonderful point, and that's one that I, I feel that that is kind of the issue when it comes to talking about these technologies, and it's the one that always gets marginalized. It's the one that nobody wants to talk about. Like the official transhumanists, the ones who label themselves as such. They'll get up there and they'll talk about virtual ra- reality and artificial intelligence and life extension, how it's going it's the best thing ever and how we have to do it. They'll they'll go on and on all day. They'll say they'll come up with all sorts of ideas and like basically sit up there and read you plots from science fiction films. Uh, it's it's the same thing. It's what they're doing. But when it comes to talking about uh, the military connection to these things and even talking about narrow AI systems that are fully entrenched in uh, many different areas uh, from biological technology to uh, policing and um, surveillance and things like this. They, they won't talk about those things. They won't talk about like the real practical issues. They won't talk about um, the military industrial complex. They'll just talk about their little science fiction stories and say how wonderful it is all day and say that if you're opposed to it, you're just wacky and stupid and what what could you be thinking? This is and how could you even think that? So, yeah, that's a real issue we have to drive home. I was, I was going to ask you, Aaron, um, for, for our listeners out there that really don't know too much about transhumanism, um, what, why should they be concerned about um, the, the, the direction of where things are going? Why, why should it be a bad thing? Uh, well, we should be concerned because uh, transhuman technologies are being developed. And these things aren't, uh, they're not totally science fiction. I'm, they're being sold through science fiction, but at the same time, they are real. And there are many government to- documents that uh, detail this and talk about what should be done with them. And it's a real aspect of uh, where the world is going. Uh, this, this transhumanist agenda is uh, very much a real thing and um we have to understand uh what that means and where we're all going so i mean it's fundamentally it's about the 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 alteration of our very genetics of our very 
uh, essence, our, our, our humanness. It's, it's the changing of that, the uh, remodeling of that. And um, so <laughs> if that's going to happen, obviously we all have a vested interest in that. So th- this conversation has to has to be in the public and it has to be um, open and everybody has to really uh, be aware of what these issues um where they came from, what they actually are, what the real issues involved are, and not be kind of uh, sidetracked by uh, fantastical speculation and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right, because um, the bottom line is that people aren't being told the real story about this, are they? Because um, basically what we're getting is we're getting pro-transhuman material um, through Hollywood, um, which is just advertised, or sorry, just presented to you as being, oh, it's part of the story, and you know, technology is moving along. And it's only natural that this would be included, and people don't really think about it too much. And it's all, you know, to to uh, it's always to our benefit. It's always advantageous. You know, it, it always helps us save the day, or or be Superman, or live longer, or do amazing things in some virtual reality like uh, like Neo from the Matrix. Um, but but what people aren't being told is where this technology is coming from. Um, who's funding it, and um, and why? Uh, and I think those are the biggest questions that people have to ask because it's um, it's very easy to just dismiss people who are asking questions as luddites or ultra conservatives or or what have you. Um, but the the bottom line is that the the real truth about this isn't is it isn't being publicized. We're basically just getting PR, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. It's public uh, relations all the way, and. Uh, one of the marks of public relations is carbon copy news stories. This is how public relations firms operate. They have their clients. They work on their clients' behalf. They write up basically uh, one general story that's um, beneficial to their client. In this case, let's say the client is, um, let's just say it's a company that wants to market uh, implantable brain chips. And so the PR company that's working for this uh, technology company will uh, see to it that they place this one article, because all they have to do is write one article. They hand it out to different people that they know in different media outlets. So they'll hand it out to a newspaper. They'll hand it out to another newspaper, another one. They'll hand it out to a TV station. They'll hand it out to all these um, media people, which uh, they're friends with. That's how PR works. So you basically just have to write up one story and then hand it out uh, to a million different outlets, and then there you go. It's it's you're broadcasting your message, and um, you don't even have to overt overtly say, oh, like with the story, like oh, this company's so great, they're making a brain chip. I mean, they do have many stories like this, but sometimes like uh, it gets even more involved with that. Uh, We see the big transhuman and singularity sales pitch PR pieces now in the forms of Ray Kurzweil's singularity. You've probably mm. seen you've probably seen this news story somewhere. It's like in yeah. time, it's in on TV, it's it's everywhere. So it's what how PR works again is carbon copy news stories. They just they make one story, they go, okay, here it is, here's your outline. You can you can embellish it a little bit, but you know, this these are the points to hit. They send it out to all the media outlets and then Everybody in the world is now talking about uh, Ray Kurzweil's singularity because it's so intriguing and um, yeah, and it works. <laughs> That's how public relations works. And, and of course, he gets to um, show up on all these uh, talk shows, and, and he gets to be the big hero coming out on stage, and um, you know, the, the man of the future, you know, leading us all towards this utopia. And um, yeah, and there's not a lot of real discussion that ever goes on in these situations because. Um, Basically, you're looking at a guy who, um, in my opinion, has a rather large ego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's always the case with these spokesmen. You just find some guy who like loves being in the spotlight and loves being the center of attention. Yeah. And you can just like throw uh, the work of thousands, if not millions, of people onto this guy and like, look, this is his idea. Like, give me yeah. a break. Like, his, he's like the one guy that's making this happen. Come on. That's he not how the world the, works. He can be the front man for it all. Yeah. 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 It's amazing, isn't it? it really is. Yeah, yeah so, <clears throat> obviously, um, 
basically what we're seeing is is just um, is pro 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 transhumanism um, from wall to wall. You know, um, there is very little um, real discussion on what the the pros and cons are. And of course, when these people do their PR stories, um, one thing that they'll often do, uh, I've noticed, is that they'll they'll have a little devil's advocate line somewhere in the middle, um, where it's kind of a, to appease the the suspicious people, and um, it'll just be some like some really um, some really weak little stab at a possible problem with it, yeah. and then it'll be appeased by. Uh, but experts say, you know, yeah. yeah. But experts say actually it's it's going to be okay, and the the benefits outweigh the risks, and um, so so it's incredible what can be done um, by by omission, isn't it? In, in this way, how um, all the all the possible pos- positives of this thing just get promoted through the roof. Um, you know, talk, especially in terms of um, you know um, giving sight to the blind, you know, and that and that kind of thing. It's always marketed in that way. And then um, any possible problems are always just explained away by the, the, the Ray Kurzweil figure, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a key aspect of the formula of public relations that, uh, yeah, you have to, um, because all these technologies are innately um, dangerous in many ways, and, and the normal person can pick up on that, and uh, you have to appease them, be like, oh, it's all right, it's all right. And it's also the creation of, overall with these uh, PR pieces, it's the creation of this feeling of inevitability in that whether it's good or bad, like you can't even stop it anyway. Like it's just progress. It's just science. Like, well, we started science a long time ago. We can't just stop it now. You know I mean, like, like this is the only way we can go. So definitely the creation of this feeling of inevitability is uh, key. Yeah, yeah. Um and another thing which I always find interesting, and I think it's something you brought up uh, on a previous talk, um, was that how, the, the way that this predictive programming works um, is that they will, as you say, surround us with it and engulf us with it to the point where we've subconsciously and consciously grown to believe that it's absolutely inevitable. Um, but people will notice that if you look at when this stuff was kind of first being bought into the mainstream um, through things like Star Trek and Terminator, um, that it was kind of a hellish situation. You know, it was kind of a nightmare situation of, like, technology out of control, completely dehumanized, really horrible, everyone hated it, you know. Um, but And you'd wonder, you'd wonder why would they be doing that? If they're trying to promote this technology, then why are they making it out to be so negative and scary um, in the films that they're funding? And one interesting point that you've brought up would be, uh, was that um, the reason they have to do this is because it's something of a, kind of like a cathartic release for the public mind in a way. They've got to play out the worst fears first. They've got to get it out of everybody's systems, um, whilst at the same time making it seem inevitable. So that when the time comes for this stuff to come out into the public, um, the debate has been channeled into a very small area. So everybody's kind of gotten over the fears and has realized that, oh, well, you know, um, if, if we don't have good AI, then we're going to have bad AI. So we better start making good AI to make sure that, that we don't have this Terminator 2 bog situation on our hands. We'll just, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's the way it works, absolutely. Because as, as we're saying... Um, extremely intelligent AI systems that can self-replicate uh, or uh, brain chips, chips that we put in our brain, actual computer chips, uh, they have staggering implications that any human being that hears them at first is going to be scared of them. And so you you have to appease this fear. If, if, if your agenda is to eventually like, okay, we, we're making these AIs, we're making these brain chips. We have to get people to accept them. Well, you have to deal with the fact that people are going to be uh, reluctant to accept these ideas. And we're like, no, that's, that sounds horrible. Like, what? Are, are you crazy? Like, are you a mad scientist? What's the deal here? So, again, yeah, you make the film that uh, is the cathartic release, as you called it. And um, if we look at the Terminator series of films specifically, we can see this process um quite clearly you see the first terminator film 
uh, the Terminator machine, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a terrible monster. It's a monster movie, and the monster is the AI machine. It just keeps coming. It keeps coming. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. And then at the end, they finally kill it, but then it comes back, <laughs> and it comes <laughs> back in the second film. And, uh, well, how, how does it come back in the second film? We find the exact same monster character is now the savior hero character. So, uh, psychologically, the way this works, we, we have to break down these movies um, in terms of our own, how, how we view them psychologically, like the psychological effect they have on yeah. us. So, yeah. so, so the, the monster is no longer a monster. He's actually a hero. And that makes us go, oh, you know what? Like, maybe, maybe, uh, but, but we still have the evil AI, which is an even more advanced version. But the way to defeat it, again, is with good AI. And this turns into the good AI versus bad AI. And the only answer then is not to completely ignore AI and say, you know what, well, let's just forget that and let's develop some other kind of science. We don't really need AI anyway. The the debate then becomes, well, how are we going to make good AI? Because AI could uh, clearly go bad and we have to make it. So we have to... And, and there, are, there are specialists in this field of... Uh, making a uh, benevolent AI that this is actually like a field within the AI research community and <laughs> making friendly AI. <laughs> so yeah. there you have it. There's another interesting concept in, um, or a theme rather in the Terminator two, um, is that, um, John Connor is, doesn't have a father in that film. The father isn't present. Mm-hmm. And so the, um, T what T 800 Schwarzenegger character, serves to be the father in that film so there's a lot of emotional triggering going on there for the child you know the child who's lost the father gets the father replaced by ai and so the bond is created you know absolutely yeah they play to our innate primitive uh drives and our survival instincts and what we are as humans like these these uh principles are well known and played to in film to again psychologically get the effect that they are going for yeah so the the machine becomes the father becomes part of the family so so you associate with it and and the father traditionally is the protector he's the guy who protects the family and the tribe and all that so you know oh, oh he's this this machine is now our protector yeah yeah that's right so um the, they really are very good at this, aren't they? <laughs> they're, yeah, yeah, they are. Well, they're not afraid to tell you they're magicians, and they mean that. Yeah, they, they really are. Um, so obviously we've talked a little bit about um, how transhumanism is being marketed um, and presented to us through all these films, and I'd like to get back to that in a bit more detail later on because it connects to so many other things. But um, for, for the meantime, I, I'd just like to talk a wee bit about the history of transhumanism because that's something that you've definitely brought out well in your film and in your book. Um, but for people who are listening and perhaps aren't familiar with um, either the film or the book, or maybe they've not looked that deeply into this, can you just give us a little bit of the history of, of where transhumanism, tra- <laughs> transhumanism actually comes from? Um, because it's got quite a long history, and it comes from a place uh, and a kind of group of ideologies that people might not suspect at first, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And uh, the history can be traced back to the really what the basic idea of transhumanism even is now which is to take evolution human evolution into human hands and make it speed up so that is the just looking at that aspect of transhumanism we can go back in time to the idea of eugenics and again this has been said by many others as well uh sir julian huxley uh first director general of unesco was the man who coined transhumanism in its modern sense. And he described it in this way. He said uh, he described it as man remaining man, but using his intelligence to speed up evolution, basically as something to that effect. It was in his uh, piece that he wrote called New Bottles for New Wine. But of course, uh, Julian Huxley was an ardent uh, eugenicist, um, very high level, uh, prominent eugenicist he's got a long list of awards from all the eugenics societies he's um 
high-ranking member in many of them. Uh, and the the idea of eugenics itself is uh, it's it's about taking human evolution into human hands and speeding it up through uh, the under <laughs> what what they believe is the understanding of genetics. And um, of course, with the the old eugenic method is to breed um, certain people uh, with other certain people for specific reasons, uh, for specific genetic traits that they have. And doing this is a bit, it's akin to breeding dogs, which again, Julian Huxley uh, writes about and many other eugenicists are. They're always talking about breeding dogs and how uh, and there's so many points just with eugenics itself. I could go on and on with like the little things they write in their books. Like, oh yeah, the civilized countries, they're so good at um, breeding dogs and the uncivilized countries don't. And like, the, the, and at the same time, when they talk about breeding dogs, they say, uh, they bring out the cruel and um, very violent nature of the eugenic creed itself. They're like, oh yeah, you just dispose of all the... Um, uh, the, the runts of the litter basically yeah you, you get rid of those to perfect the type and, and and they just they just say this like oh yeah you you just uh kill off all the useless ones when you're breeding the dogs and then you get the perfect breed in the end but it's totally ruthless totally violent total control freak mentality that doesn't even work out doesn't even create evolution to begin with it degenerates uh gene- genetics and this it's total control freak mentality that doesn't even work but the being a control freak they can uh the control freak cannot admit that they are wrong so they just keep doing the same thing over and over again and the power of their will will never be uh it will you you can never stop the power of their will because they honestly believe they're right because their eugenics again is a religion and this is a religious thing and I don't know if I got to the tie to modern transhumanism there, but I, I, I'm sure we could further dig into this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, it's it's kind of a, it's a psychopathic mindset, isn't it? And um, and if you look at eugenics um, and the kind of people who are backing that, and the kind of offices that they, that they held, and the kind of influence that they had, um, the, this is a network that goes goes back um, quite a long time, and. Not only is it to do with eugenics, but eugenics is essentially something that was kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was kind of legitimized through Darwinism. You know, it had been around as kind of a, almost like a theology um, for, for, for a lot longer, but um, it was kind of legitimized and really brought, brought uh, forward um, and popularized um, through Darwin, wasn't it? And the idea of scientism is big in this too. Science as religion, and um, very much yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. With Darwin, even the, the family connections in the promotion of these ideas, we see uh, the connection between the families with um, Galton, uh, Sir Francis Galton, um, advocating the idea of eugenics. He was the first one to uh, really like write the books and put the idea out there. Uh, he, he was uh, closely related to Charles Galton Darwin. I think they were like what second cousins or something. They're they're cousins, I do believe, and mm-hmm. so I, that's all in the same family. And of course, you have the Huxley uh, family involved in this once again from the very beginning of uh, Darwinism. T. H. Huxley, Julian Huxley's father, was uh, not father but grandfather. I'm sorry. He was Darwin's bulldog because he was the spokesman for. Darwin and Darwinism. He was the guy there at the Royal Society saying, like, look, we got to get this idea through. And what you don't learn in history is that, um, popular history at least, is that the reason that they had to push the idea of Darwinism is because it's it, it's an agenda. It's, it's um, agenda packaged as science, and it is also a religion, as we're saying too. It's a religion, and... Um, now, in modern day, uh, in a modern day sense, to take it to where we are now, Darwinism and um, genetics, well, they've come a long way, but uh, now, now the idea of Darwinistic evolution is a religious idea to most people because you're like, oh, yeah, that's just true. Like, and that, that's that. It's like, oh, yeah, evolution, D- Darwinian evolution is a fact, 
And that's that's about it. That's where the conversation goes with the, the average person. You can't you can't say, well, yo, what about this? Or like, you know, what about? Th-? You can't have a con- conversation about any intricacies or any details. It's all just, oh yeah, yeah, that's science. So so they get us to believe that this is science, and eugenics as well, substantiated by Darwinism, science. Uh, eugenics is pseudoscience, so it's. Uh, <laughs> legitimated yeah. by what we believe is science and at a time eugenics was totally mainstream in the 1920s there that all the major university genetics guys they were like oh yeah yeah they, they were espousing eugenics like oh yeah this is and and also the social aspects of eugenics they were kind of uh making this push for making it a political thing and politicizing their science their scientific religion it's so science religion politics it's all the same thing it's all about uh agendas it's all about putting your ideas out there and forcing people to just believe them and not question them not dissect the them as you should because that's what uh that's what a person who has critical thinking ability does you dissect things and go okay well you can't just come out here and flatly tell me that uh this broad topic is just a uh, fact you, you you that's not that's not how things work it's far more no, detailed no. than that yeah um but but that's what's happened yeah. um it's, it's it's incredible how how eugenics and well not eugenics but darwinism has been basically turned into a, an entire belief system just through repetition and through literature and through more repetition and through um, generational handing down of um, beliefs and ideologies to the point now where, I mean, it basically is an entire belief system. I mean, you can't have an argument with somebody about this because, oh, it's just true. As you say, it's, it's just true. It, we all know that. It's common sense. It's common knowledge, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's amazing what you can do if you repeat something enough with the right authority figures. And, of course, you've had these people come out down through throughout the ages who have kind of been the scientific heroes. You know, you've had Darwin who was picked by the Royal Society to legitimize it and then you know today we've got the equivalent of him which is kind of like well we had Bertrand Russell as well and then of course there was we've got we've now got Richard Dawkins as well mm-hmm. and um the, the there's so many holes in what they're saying I mean, <laughs> these guys I mean the kind of the personality type you were describing before were just the, massive egos who could just yeah be, the the, uh, the audacity of these guys just like yeah. declaring and saying i'm right i'm right and and then people actually sitting there and soaking it up saying he's right and then they're the the, the people's uh, repeating what uh the guy in the podium saying are just uh expanding the problem like no he isn't right he's just saying something that he wants you to believe like nobody is right in everything that that's they're not taking into consideration the fact that subjective reality is um, is a powerful thing <laughs> and that at any given time you can make anything true in people's minds just by by uh, taking authority just by saying you have it. It's ridiculous. I was going to say... Um... Well, what you were saying there earlier on about the you know it being a, an agenda, <clears throat> it's um, it's amazing when you when you look at uh, how it's all structured. I mean, it's, it's so well coordinated what they're doing just now. Um, you know the sort of direction we're going in. Uh, when you look at um, you know the the media that we were talking about earlier on, uh, how you know it's so well coordinated through music videos, everything. I mean, uh, people are, are so well managed today that um, they're, they're, they are quite naive in the sense that um, they, they think they're going towards a sort of a benevolent utopia when uh, the, the establishment has sort of other plans, you know. Totally, yeah. And um, so, I mean, they have said in their the books, like um, there was one book, um, I can't, it escapes me now, but they, they were talking about how they wanted to perfect the the, the workforce and um, the, the the establishment themselves would sort of steer the ship. Uh, well, they would uh, perfect the, the workers below. Um, yeah. I, I just I find it amazing that the, the the way things are going just now. It is. It is, and like you pointed out, it's. Uh... The way to understand that this is an agenda, which it very much is, there are many different agendas that are actually all part of one agenda when you uh, connect the dots, 
it's it's what what we're do what we're doing what we have to do is actually connected dots that's what we uh have to do to counteract the uh the negative effects possible effects of these agendas actually going through we have to see that there are patterns in things and the patterns are the keys to the agendas. When you see something over and over and over again, you see the same themes pop up in films, the same ideas, the same even like corny slogans repeated in not just one place, but like in what uh, appear to be totally different avenues. Like you'll have a pop star up on stage uh, saying, you know, uh, we have to be green and reduce our carbon footprint. And then you see a, also a politician saying the same thing. We have to notice the patterns there and understand that, uh, you know, that nothing in this world happens in a vacuum and everything's interconnected. And yes, there are agendas and it behooves us to understand what they are, where they come from, um, what they mean, why they're being promoted. And yeah, that's that's what we're doing right now. Uh, I know it's, it's amazing what you're saying there uh, regarding the, the, the green agenda. Because um, the, the, the more you study this, you, you realize that there is definitely a connection between the, the green agenda and the transhumanism as well. Yeah, there really is. And, and again, that's a connection that most people wouldn't make. They'd be like, oh, yeah, sustainable development, that's one thing. Uh, high technology, that's another. But they, they go together uh, quite neatly. And again, spokespeople like Ray Kurzweil get up there and they, they talk about how... Uh, we have nano enhanced solar panels and that's going to save the earth and all this. And so that's one aspect. And you also have the government documents that get into converging technologies, literally saying like, this is the way that we're going to save the earth. We're going to do it with these, um, converging technologies. So, so we, we have to, that's, uh, that's just one aspect of what converging technology is going to be used for is, uh, sustainable development. Mm hmm yeah yeah it really does it blows me away just thinking about it all it really does yeah it does and it's it's amazing because again with the promotion of these things you see it, it sometimes they'll go as far to uh, promote all these ideas all in one thing like uh th there's a festival coming up here in santa monica california called the new world fest I th it was supposed to be in june it's going to be in october now i think New, New World Fest, that's an interesting name to begin with, but it's more interesting to see what they're promoting at it. Number one, they're promoting the greening and sustainable development and all that. Uh, but they also mix in high technology in this, and they um, have even New Age spiritual stuff that they say they're going to have uh, things with that. And you'll see uh, spokespeople that... Uh, I at least for me, I've seen these same spokespeople pop up before. They're having Ed Begley Jr. Uh, do something there, and he's um, appeared at many transhuman events. He's a big kind of uh, celebrity. He's he's a celebrity voice that they use to promote transhumanism because he himself is into the idea. I mean, I'm sure he is. I, I don't doubt that. But uh, so so I'm sure he'll be up there giving a transhumanist spiel at this New World Fest. But it's the mixing of new age spirituality of the uh, green agenda and of transhumanism all in one <laughs> one area so and, and yeah it's, it's just amazing we see this over and over again mm -hmm. yeah it's um <clears throat> it's amazing how well coordinated it is um when you look at these different areas as you're saying um because there are so many different areas um and when you see what's happening today with this big technological revolution and so many of these different um, agendas kind of being woven into this basic, basically eugenics uh, agenda, um, you, you know, you really realize that the, the groundwork for this was, was laid a long time ago, you know. Um, and I'm not sure if you've seen the documentary, uh, The Net. Um, it's called The Net and it's subtitled The Unabomber, LSD and the Internet. Um, it's basically a documentary, a German documentary about um, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and it goes to his past and his history and the kind of people that he was involved with and the ideas that were going around back in the 60s to do with cybernetics and, and LSD and, uh, and technology and, and how the military got involved. Um, 
um, when you really look at the, the technological setup that was, was going on back then, um, it, it makes you realize um, how well planned for it is. And one of the most interesting things um, when you look at Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, um, is that he's basically served as this kind of symbol for anti-technology. Um, he's kind of been a, a, the, the heroic martyr for these, um, these what do you, I'm not sure what you'd call them, but, you know, the, the ultra-conservative Luddite people, whoever yeah. they are. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's, it's almost as if they've deliberately created the dialectic um, in planning for what was coming. You know, because at this time when cybernetics was, was coming out and they, they realized that they were going to be building a world wide web where everything could be connected. And I'm sure some people realized ahead of time that this would eventually transform into the transhuman uh, technologies and there would eventually be um, the kind of technology we're seeing now. It's like they've actually created their own, um, their own enemy to, to basically make sure that the, the argument on transhumanism stays you're either with it and you're pro and you support it and you don't question it or you're a unabomber, you know? Yes, absolutely. And that film, uh, the net is excellent. I did see an hour's worth of it. Um, is it longer than an hour? Cause it ended abruptly. So, it's an, I think it's an hour and 45 minutes, maybe an hour and 50 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the copy I have was just part of it, but it was amazing because it does a really good job connecting these dots that we're talking about and saying how, like, you know, the uh, hippie movement, LSD, the military, uh, big universities, cybernetics, uh, and art, they all intertwine. And it's so good at depict- depicting that because that's really how our world works. Like, it's not just like one, it's not all these separate things uh, working in their own little spheres, but rather it's all kind of like one symbiotic thing. And yeah. and again, with with Ted Kaczynski, you're right. Um he is definitely the symbol now. He is a symbol for um, just anti-technological society thought. And um, the big problem, what they use him for is to totally throw out amazing intellectual arguments, the likes of which uh, are like Jockey Lowe's Technological Society, the book. I know that they've mentioned in news reports that Kaczynski loved that book he loved the technological society which is an amazing book so they get to throw uh, wonderful pieces like that wonderful social criticisms out the window because this guy did terrorist acts and so yeah again you also uh, link the idea of somebody who just questions technology to terrorism so we get the whole terrorism thing which terrorism links into this whole transhuman thing fundamentally as well so fundamental and people don't we could go on and on about how terrorism and national security and the like fits into this whole agenda and that that's something that people really they will never talk about they don't understand they don't want to talk about and it's very taboo and it's that's the real danger of where we're going is um yeah. this whole security state they're building up that's right and um <clears throat> just interestingly on the note of um on, of how terrorism relates to transhumanism, um, you just reminded me of a film I saw recently called Source Code. Um, have you seen that? Source Code, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really recommend it. It's um, basically a film about um, a guy who is um, basically mortally wounded um, in Afghanistan flying a helicopter, and he is become is basically his his body and his mind become part of some heinous military experiment where his brain can be basically transported back in time or his consciousness rather can be transported back in time into uh the body of another person and he can inhibit that body and use it to do reconnaissance hmm. and um so there's a that basically he's sent back in time to try and prevent um a uh, a bomb blowing up on a train um, so it's all very modern. It's very up to date. Um, and of course, um, the bomb is, uh, turns, um, sorry, there's a bit of a spoiler for people who haven't seen it, but the bomb turns out, the bomber turns out to be, um, this Ted Kaczynski type, you know, this mm-hmm. guy makes a big speech about te- how technology is destroying everything. And we need to, we need to ruin things and we need to bring everything down to ashes and then start from scratch again, because this world is hell. And, um, uh, he's kind of like a, uh, a young white male as well. Um, yes, yes. Keith, so uh, yeah. 
Yeah, big key there, definitely. Um, and um, you know, that there's little snippets in the film about how this this terrorist was um, he he was known to be posting blogs and <laughs> criticizing the government. You know, <laughs> so yeah. it's it's all in there. You know, it's it's really it's really all in there. It's a big big link to terrorism. I mean, um, I mean, as you say, we could go on about it for a long time, but I mean. I mean, what would you say are the kind of maybe the the, the few main links, um, the the few main connections that are really important? Sure. Well, um, the establishment of converging technologies, developing them and creating a transhumanized world even and a world where there's nanotechnology, uh, high nanotechnology used in medicine, in, um, well, every field of human existence. This creates a security risk, the creation of these um, technologies, because they're so powerful, they have the power in the wrong hands to create massive destruction. And so uh, we have set up a situation where a terrorist organization can easily cook up um, whatever, a biological weapon in their own basement or they can uh, they can steal somebody's identity, or they can hack into a brain chip, and um, you know it's all those evil hackers and terrorists organization. And with this, um, I mean that, that's just how it goes. If you develop these things, these threats exist. And the thing to understand about these threats is the uh, concept of false flag terrorism. How it is a fact of history. Um, governments use terrorism to uh, legitimate uh, basically taking the freedom of the public away. So in a world where you develop these technologies, I believe where it's going is um, the, a government, an authoritarian government can rise to power and legitimize itself as being the protector figure again this father figure like the terminator it begets gets to be the protector father figure because there's all this danger and we have to regulate everything and it's it's so funny the transhumanists think like it's gonna be some sort of libertarian uh, dream come true like oh we're gonna be so free and technology will allow us to do any anything no it won't because it'll all be controlled by the government it be because of safety and security, because it's such a safety and security risk, you have to tightly regulate everything, regulate people's lives to the tiniest little degree because because these technologies become a part of their very biology, and so we get uh, we get an authoritarian government and and that legitimizes itself as uh, providing safety and security. And that's a direct evolution out of where all the terror scaring that, because all this false flag terrorism that's happened in our time, which is, that's exactly what it is. Let's call, call it for what it is. It's all leading up to that. And the technological agendas, um, uh, feed into that in that way, because that's where they're going with all this. That's the direction. I mean, that's, that's it. I, I'm, I'm totally convinced of, of it myself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be amazing to see the kinds of technology that they're going to be able to justify through this um, fake terrorist threat, mm -hmm. um, such as the, the whole RFID thing and, um, you know, um, uh, the biomimetics and the security cameras. Um, and I mean, they've even installed those in some airports in the U.S. now where we've got um, these, um, I think it's, yeah, the biomimetic camera that will look at um, a person's body movements and maybe do like infrared on their heat and stuff like that. And it will actually um, run um, a probability analysis to determine whether that person um, is likely to commit a crime. <laughs> so it's kind of like minority report uh, pre-crime situation that's actually being rolled out um, at, uh, for real. You know, this this stuff's already here. And of course, it's, you know, to prevent terrorism, you know, so... You can get arrested for something you haven't done, you know? And they do mention this, these ideas specifically in government reports as well. They say that, um, th that they want to understand the motivations of people and of groups. There's, there's a section in that NBIC report that I get into in the, the Age of Transitions that gets in this specifically. But, yeah, they basically want to enact pre-crime through total knowledge, what they can claim as uh, knowledge, at least, of what somebody's going to do ahead of time. They're like, oh, we can tell that he's going to do something. But, but again, that's uh, taking authority where you can't, you cannot predict the future. You can pretend like you have some technology that allows you to do that, 
But at the end of the day, uh, it only operates because you're scaring everybody to death into uh, you're going off fear because like, oh, look, these terrorists are out there. We have to know what they're thinking ahead of time. And and that also means we have to monitor you because, uh, well, you know, anyone's a potential terrorist. You saw Ted Kaczynski. He was he was uh, an intelligent white man <laughs> that was, uh, uh, you know, he's an he went to college and totally unsuspecting, uh, or so it seems. So we have to watch everybody. We, we have to do it now. So, so uh, yeah, definitely that's, that's what they want to do. And they put it in writing in these government reports. I mean, this is, this isn't me even saying this, like, uh, it's not my opinion saying, Oh yeah, this is, this is the agenda. It's, it's in the government documents. So, I mean, I, I, I have that specific one on my website if anybody cares to read it yeah no um we've both looked at that document obviously it's a really important one because it's um it does detail um exactly what capability they've got now um and where it could be going in the future and um if obviously the uh, the golden rule <clears throat> with um these people is that if they're talking about something now it means they've they probably did it 10 years ago yeah um, so what they've got now i mean it, it it almost doesn't bear thinking about in a way. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so just as we sort of um, begin to um, round things up for the first hour before we take our break, Aaron, um, I just wanted to um, get into a, a sort of a, a few questions about, I mean, if, if you wanted to just round up, what are the, the kind of maybe three or four key areas of transhumanistic technology that are most important. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got chips, we've got AI, um, and um, we've got a lot of sort of drugs as well. I mean, that drugs and pharma, pharmaceuticals play into this a lot too. Um, but I mean, what would you say are the, some of the main things that are of most concerning to us at the moment that are kind of being rolled out? I would say that AI is a big one because, again, it's very misunderstood um, so many narrow AI systems out there doing many tasks that uh, we that that we don't uh, we, we don't ever talk about. We don't we're not consciously aware of how many AI systems are at work in our world today and basically monitoring us. They are the surveillance systems, um, uh, the intelligence systems behind the surveillance systems to make uh, sense of massive amounts of data mined data. So that's a big one. And I would say, yeah, the, the idea of cybernetics is huge because, again, it, uh, this fits into medicine as well. Um, just the uh, implantation of technologies and, and the merging of um, genetics with machines. And uh, we, we can see this uh, being promoted very much now, and it is coming. And um it, it it will affect medicine, as I say, and uh, I don't know. There's they're also important. I, I guess virtual reality too, because we're already living within virtual reality, and we don't even realize it. It's just uh, with the transhuman idea, it's about perfecting the virtual reality we're already in, and kind of perpetuating it in a scientific manner, uh, perpetuating a false reality. It, creating as an artist your idea of an idealized reality and perpetuating it indefinitely and um, kind of in a way forcing it on people with uh without not being to you're not totally being forceful in that the people actually enjoy uh accepting the false reality they, they enjoy living in there because they've been convinced that actual reality is sucks basically and it's terrible <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's uh, things that we can all see if we're, you know, if we're watching what's what's happening outside the window. Yeah. Um, but obviously, we've got a lot more to get into, um, and there's a number of different things that um, we'd like to talk about in the next hour. But um, for now, we'll, we'll just take a quick break, and um, we'll see you on the other side.
Okay, so we're back in the second hour with Aaron Franz, um, talking about transhumanism, um, the technological revolution, and um, the post-human world. Um, we're going to talk about a number of different subjects uh, in this hour, basically um, what this kind of technology is. We're going to go into a lot more detail on that, um, and also how serious it is as well, um, because it's being marketed as being something that's um, inevitable, something that's fun, something that's really going to take humanity up to a new level. Um, but when you study what this is, uh, you realize that that's really not the case at all. So, so Scott, there's a quote there from the NBIC pre-publication. Um, now, the NBIC was basically a, it was a meeting held back at uh, Loyola University back in 2001, where a number of um, academics, uh, policymakers, and corporate bodies got together um, on the subject of nano, um, bio, in informatic and cognitive technologies uh, in the name of improving human performance. Yes, and uh, this was organized and sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Commerce. Uh, so the, the piece is um, it's titled Hive Mind, and this is a quote. If we can easily exchange large chunks of knowledge and are connected by high bandwidth communication paths, the function and purpose served by individuals becomes unclear. Individuals have served to keep the gene pool stirred up and healthy via sexual rep uh, reproduction, but this data handling process would no longer necessarily be linked to individuals. With knowledge no longer encapsulated in individuals, the distinction between individuals and the entirety of humanity would blur. Think Vulcan main meld. We would perhaps become more of a hive mind, an enormous single intelligent entity. And that's the end of the quote. Yeah, and um, mind you, this is the National Science Foundation and Department of Commerce and everybody who is uh, gathered at that uh, workshop. It's them saying this. It's not some hippy dippy goofball like uh, spouting some weird stuff on an acid trip. This is serious stuff. They actually mean it, and they're talking about the role of the individual human being within the greater system as it is emerging. And uh, with systems theories and all that, it goes back to cybernetics again. And much of this has to do with, well, everything has to do with our perception of the world and how we see ourselves. And basically with the emergence of high technology and computers and all this, we have taken that, which is our technological creation, and we, uh, we idolize it so much that we actually describe our own humanity in the terms of our creation so we're describing ourselves in terms of our technological creation so <laughs> we're building up technology uh and we're claiming that we we are that technology and, and so, so that's what leads us into the situation and the hive mind is just um it's a perfection of that particular point of view, that, that system that they're talking about, because it's about the overall system that is society. How does it work? It works on getting the individual to subordinate their will and their time and their effort to a great extent toward uh, ends that they probably wouldn't pursue if they didn't feel as if they were forced to do something, as something as simple as going to work. Yeah, I mean, like most people hate going to work and they verbalize this and there's plenty of comedy uh, about this, like, yeah, oh, I hate work, you know, and that's just kind of laughing off a deeper issue, which is what are we doing at work to begin with? Um, we're working towards this greater, uh, greater goal that is the um, building up civilization as we know it. And th there's, this ties into so many different areas. Of, but, but again, um, the, the perfected version of the hive mind is, um, is that the individual 
eventually doesn't serve a purpose anymore because it's the more effective way to build up the larger system is to have connect the nodes because people have become people are uh, identified as technology now there's no difference between technology and humanity or biology it's all the same thing now cybernetically since it's all the same thing we should connect it in the most efficient way possible so we set up this giant network of uh, human beings with they're connected in some way either through a brain chip or just through uh, even through internet connection at a basic level but with transhuman technologies it gets further you connect them and you create this hive mind because it will that's the way to actually build a macrocosmic mind and you can actually as symbolically you could view each individual as just they just become a neuron or a node or a little portion on a computer chip to help that chip operate uh, all the faster and progress and go further and go further and go further it's all about taking technological progress further yeah yeah that's right and um <clears throat> it's uh, it's interesting to see um going going a little bit deeper into into how this stuff's being promoted and um how it's um kind of being sold to the public um it's interesting to see that so many of these ideas in a, in a kind of a basic kind of vague sense um have been sort of injected into the new age culture and obviously the the unabomber documentary goes into this but um kind of more recently um, I'm just looking at your book uh, in the chapter, Let's Get Real. Now, this is uh, Aaron Franz's book, Revolve. And um, in there, you've got a quote from um, Barbara Marciniak um, in her book, uh, Bringers of the Dawn, which um, I believe is a New Age book uh, where she was purported to be channeling some kind of, um, some kind of extraterrestrial spirit or some kind of um, you know, non-local consciousness. Yeah. And she says... What is occurring upon the planet now is the literal mutation of your physical body, for you are allowing it to be evolved to a point where it will be a computer that can house this information. And I just thought that was very interesting. I know. Just look at the terms that they're using in that. They're using the terms computer, uh, housing information, evolve. And they're linking this to evolution, of course. And uh, all at the same time, it's in this new age spiritual context. So it's the actual rising of technology again to this level of religion, a new religion where we're, we're spiritualizing machines uh, <laughs> and whether or not they deserve that, uh, that, that deserves to be questioned. But yeah, yeah, we, we, see, we see the connection between the transhumanist agenda and this new age so-called channeled material if we're not questioning what this channeled material is where what channels is it being broadcast from that's what we need to ask where's it channeling down from you know what i mean because a channel is just you know it's like a one little uh, offshoot of a larger thing so where is it being channeled from it's not being channeled from some alien being in the pleiadians or whatever it's being channeled from high levels of uh government likely or the military or be uh, because um, these pieces are I'm convinced uh, complete propaganda pieces to <laughs> link the new age and transhumanism together because they're all one agenda when it comes down to it that's right and um, we see a lot of this stuff coming out um, in so many different areas um, especially in the new age about uh, global consciousness and global shift and collective consciousness and collective shift and all these sort of collective ideals where yeah. the uh, individual's mind is, is yeah. just sort of transformed into a, a collective sense and that, that ties directly into the MBIC quote that Scott read out before um, because um, some of the most scary technology that they're talking about there is um, the neurochip or the brain chip and that's actually a chip that can be implanted in the brain um, with all kinds of all kinds of different possibilities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. The neurochip is a real thing, and um, this is this is what they're promoting. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it's 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 amazing to see this. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Go ahead. In, in regards to the the hive mind, I mean, this is all being promoted to us and. When you think of it, there's been no real uh, sort of public debate about the direction we're going in. It's, it's just sort of happening. 
and um, there's no debate about um, is it right to I mean they, they talk about perfecting society I mean um, there's no debate about is it going to help us or is it going to be destructive to, to us in any way you know no yeah there really is no debate it's just a bunch of ideas rammed down our throat and then uh, eventually we again we, we come to accept them because we take them as inevitable that's what this always is so the issue becomes uh we have to remain critical and kind of force a debate and be like hey look this this is debatable whether or not you say it is and we're going to continue to bring up these points and we're going to continue pointing out uh the dots because we can see the many dots in in this world and we're connecting the dots and we've drawn a picture and uh we're gonna take this picture into the public square and show everybody and like hey look look what i found here it's a nice little drawing um i'm not the one who made it i just found it uh sitting in my attic (laughs) but uh it's an important thing for us to all look at because this is where we're going and um so we just got to keep pushing that debate and keep pushing uh, reality out in into the public domain. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I think it's really important to talk about why specifically, and especially in relation to technology like the neurochip, um, why why that needs to be debated and why that really needs to be brought out um, into the public domain to, for proper debate, you know, and proper analysis. So people really, really actually know what this technology is because obviously, um, you know, kids are, are being sort of, you know, saturated with, with all these movies about, um, you know, getting upgrades through like movies like The Matrix and then being Iron Man, you know, and having super abilities and basically being better than they were before. But I mean, when, when we look at the history of where this technology has come from, who's funding it and the kind of philosophies that these people have got and what they really want for the world. I mean, it's far from it, isn't it? I mean, if, if someone was to actually get uh, a brain chip installed or implanted rather, um, and thus would be connected to basically the internet or what's coming in now is obviously the cloud, um, that, that's it, isn't it, really? There's, there's no turning back from that point. If you, if you are willing to let your personal inner consciousness your individuality be connected out like that to all other information then you will lose who you are and there's no going back is there yeah well yeah that's it because uh, the fundamental issue is who is developing that chip that you put in there and we get the proponents of these technologies giving us the valid excuses to take neurochips again the valid excuse in this case being that we'll have control somehow over the chip which is which is the absolute most ridiculous thing one of the most ridiculous things i ever heard you did not develop that chip and uh, what the proponents are going to say is that it's going to be open source technology and that's the way around it we're going to do this open source and it's going to be totally transparent everything's going to be transparent and it's going to be okay because everybody's going to be a scientist too and everybody will be able to work on their own chip and they'll have control over their own chip in their mind well well i say no i say no that's not how this um technology has come about it's come about through decades decades of research that's been done through the military industrial complex, uh, through, uh, the university and military system, uh, long time in the making. What, what do we know of that? Do, do we have all the, uh, research papers on that? I, are, are we experts in this field? Like, are we just pretending like we know what we're doing? Like, because that gives us some false sense of security and, and also makes us feel cool. Like we're in control. Like, are we really in control of these things? I say no. That's right. I know when you think of it, I mean, so much of this technology is coming out of the, the military industrial complex, uh, of places like uh, DARPA. And I mean, these uh, organizations the, um, that, that are for warfare purposes. So, I mean, to say that it's going to be totally open source and transparent, um, uh, I mean, that, that is debatable. Naive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, look at it this way, right? Uh, if, we, if we look back, Okay, so we've got 
some of the computer stuff that we've got around today is, is open source. I mean, operating systems generally aren't, but um, a lot of other stuff is. Um, wh- when has any other life-changing um, technology been uh, transparent and open source? You know, When is it not being controlled by some massive corporation who has a monopoly on it and decides how it's going to be used and you know, totally. who's going to have it and for what reason? You know? Yeah, and even when a good open source or independent technology arises the giant corporation or comes up and buys it up and then then they have controlling interest in that yeah that happens time and again yeah over and over again i yeah. mean i mean i think i think this is one of the things which you can you can never really talk too much about is 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 this connection here when we're talking about um this this transhumanism technology and uh, the most important parts of it um is this link um, between what was its origins? I mean, obviously, we've talked a little about the philosophy and and um, the eugenics and the, the sort of Darwinism, but basically where it's been funded. And um, you, as I was saying, you, you can never talk about that too much because um, look at the military uh, today. Look, look at the history of the military, um, especially in an American context. Um, the history of industry, history of corporations. Um, and, and even the history of the, the politicians and the super super national think tanks that are behind them. And the answer's there for you, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. you don't have to look and, and to link the philosophy to the funding and the creation, creators of these technologies, again, in the NBIC report, they go on, they write specifically about Darwinism. They, they write about that, and there's, they, they talk about how to Darwinize society with these converging technologies. And they also, interestingly enough, talk about in there about culture creators, and they use that term specifically, culture creators, how, have, how they have to uh, elicit culture creators to promote these ideas, and that comes back to the promotion, the predictive programming. So they just write openly about this stuff, about uh, how, how uh, Darwinism is you know, part of their philosophy and part of the impetus for developing these technologies and how they're going to use culture creation to get people interested in it, how they have to uh, create partnerships between government and these uh, supposed what what look like grassroots movements. Oh, 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 and I should mention this, too. This uh, I just thought this. Um, William Sims Bainbridge is the guy at the NSF who he was big in sort of organizing this conference, and he was the guy who actually... Uh, wrote up the report. He was the guy who organized the report. He's also connected to transhumanism, transhumanist group known as the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. I believe Sorry. I believe mm-hmm. he's a fellow with that group, which is basically the same thing as the World Transhumanist Association. And in this section, he's the one who wrote the section about culture creation as well in the report. And he is saying that we need to find these movements that can help advocate this idea. And lo and behold, he becomes part of one of the, the most important uh, groups, one of the most important movements. And there you go. You see the tie right there. <laughs> there yeah. it is. Yeah, it's uh, for people who are actually wanting to go and look at the documentation, it's all there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was, was going to uh, say as well, it was interesting what Adam was talking about earlier on, about um, you know, I know there, there is a point where there's no turning back. Um, because we, we can witness so many times in society that well, once something comes into the mainstream, it's, it becomes normalised so fast, so quickly. Um, th- things become normalised, you know, um, there's so many different examples of it. Um, so, yeah, there is definitely a point where there's, there's no, turning by, no turning back with, these, with this sort of technology. Yeah, and so many things have been normalized that were totally abnormal just uh, decades ago within our lifetime. I know I've noticed this myself even since I was a youth. I used to watch TV and notice how the standards were changing just as I was uh, young. I was like, man, they're showing more and more on here, and like this is getting pretty intense. And I, I remember what wondering, I'm like, where are they going to end up with this? Are they going to have like nudity and... Uh, Are they going to have, like, full nudity on TV? Is this, like, really where they're going? And they've uh, basically done that, and and, and they're going for the ultraviolence and just, like, the total twisting of uh, all human, natural human social roles. They're just totally turning them on their heads. 
and any sort of uh, mores and folkways that we used to have are just get totally getting thrown out the window and, and things that would have been things that you could not have even uttered at all like like in uh, conversation even with like a close friend because they would have condemned you now it's just like lighthearted jokes on on uh evening tv it's like oh that's a funny it's funny to talk about stuff like that now it's it's that, it's hilarious that's a, sorry to interrupt. That, that's culture creation for you right there isn't it absolutely yeah i know i was, I was thinking there as well about um you know uh, virtual reality and the avatars and things like that i mean when you think of it um uh, it's amazing the the, the processor speeds of uh, computers um, that they're accelerating at such a rate, and you, you think about Moore's law, and um, that they're talking about in the future uh, is going to get to the point where graphics will become so realistic it will be like almost um, like perfect. You know, it will be like perfect graphics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, idealized version of the real world, better than the real world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. better than. Mm-hmm. So they, they talk about like um, terahertz uh, processors, all that sort of thing. Yep, yep, yeah. They're uh, again, just, yeah, just yeah. Some... totally. Yeah, computing gets faster all the time, and uh, that trend isn't changing. And yeah, it just allows for these things to go further and further. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, even with the amazing graphics in films, even like the best Hollywood films, I mean, they're going to pale in comparison to what virtual reality systems will be able to do i mean we're going to actually or i don't know if we is a good term but people will actually be living in these synthetic realities uh doing living out fantasies basically and um of course that's going to happen that's and that's where this is all heading and why are why would people not do that of course of course they do because um again it's uh, you get addicted to these things and once you're addicted addicted to anything uh, it's very tough to stop that's the nature of addiction uh, I know I was also thinking of um, that there's been so many articles in the, the mainstream newspapers uh, into regards of the, the year 2020 mm-hmm. um, the, the guy uh, Chris Parry who did the um, Department of Defense uh, document uh, strategic trends. He, he he talks about sort of matrix style uh, downloads into uh, school children by 2020, and I mean the public reading that sort of article, you know, it's like um, that's like you know crazy. Uh, you know, they they would just dismiss that sort of thing straight away. You know. Yeah, totally. But as you're saying, at the same time, uh, the official reports are saying, yeah, this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and, and again, the official reports are also saying, "Well, this is what's going to happen," and we need to put the culture creation out there to get people in line with it, basically. So, so they say all of it. The, the, the entire agenda, as it were, is contained within these official pieces. And it's it's all there for in the, in their in writing for people to yeah. look at. So it's quite obvious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they always put it in very diplomatic language, don't they? Um, and it's always, um, it's always presented to you as being something that's it's either far off in the future, you don't need to worry about that, you know, um, or it's, it's in the past. Oh, well, well, things have changed since then, you know. So basically, you know, don't, don't worry about it just now. And um, so it kind of disarms the mind, you know, it's, um, yeah. from thinking that it's anything serious. But then, of course, once that's done, they, they bring in their, their culture creators to promote this in, in just about every other area. So you just get adapted bit by bit by bit by bit, and the standards change. And um, before you know it, um, you know something they said that was happening, what was going to happen in twenty years. You know, it's more like more like five or six years. Yeah, yeah, or it's now. Yeah, totally. Yeah, or it's yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah ten years all, ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're always looking to the future. Like, oh yeah, that's what's going to happen. We are never looking at what we're actually doing. That's that's a big trick to all this too. It never. Yeah. Always confuse people and get them thinking about the past or the future, never about what they're actually doing, because then they might actually do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, it's the great way of disarming the mind. And I mean, if you just, I mean, just Scott made a comment about you know, sort of like processor speeds before, you know, of these these brain chips sort of going up into the terahertz, you know, 
Um, and it just reminded me of um, so, some work that somebody did once on on technology and the black black projects and where technology really was. And um, he had basically um, uh, he determined through um, you know a number of inside sources that um, when the public were getting um, like 667 megahertz processors in their laptops and and their PCs back in like 1999, um, the NSA. Uh, actually had those clock speeds uh, and pretty much the same kind of chip um, back in uh, 1962. You know, so it really it, it goes to show you just how far ahead they they are. I mean, if they were that far ahead back then, you can only imagine how far ahead they are now. And so, even documents like the NBIC document, I mean, that will be kind of uh, <laughs> yeah. that'll be um, that'll just be the public level stuff basically. Because I mean, if we've got a copy of it, then we know that they're way way, way further ahead, don't we? Yeah, yeah, sure. And they're always uh, uh they're always being prophetic with this. Yeah, they're always saying, "Oh, it's it's coming." Yeah, and, and um totally. They they're absolutely ahead because uh just just when we see what they're saying like, "Oh, yeah, this is going to happen." And then it does. I, that alone is um telling you uh what's happening. But also when you look at the actual programs like um the DARPA programs, they have <laughs> they've, they've got so many going all at once, all these initiatives that um, different companies and universities can uh, get grants on. And, and there's a million, there's so many of these things and they all sound like they're the exact same program. They, they've got these like quintillion speed computing programs and all this. And they're actively uh, giving out research grants for these constantly, like so many companies working on it. And at the same time, DARPA is overseeing every single project that they give a grant out to. And they have, uh, th they get to sort of collect all the work from all these different initiatives they have on the go at the same time and combine them. And there you go. That's how you converge to technology. That's kind of, DARPA specifically is an organization that is sort of like this, um, it's the umbrella to all these groups it, it, it takes all it, it sets out the initiatives it sets out what they want to do and then it consolidates all of the research into one convenient lo locale basically so yeah of, co of course they're way ahead because the, they're the ones doing this yeah they're, they're far ahead that's right yeah i know i mean when, when did uh, darpa part of the military industrial complex when, when did they suddenly become interested in and helping the the ill and the sick and the in the mainstream, you know, the, the 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 public, you know, I mean, I mean, these uh, things were specifically, you know, structured for for warfare purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the war. Uh, one one of the big secrets is that the war is not on uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya or whatever. The war is on us. <laughs> They're waging <laughs> war on us. Yeah, the, the war is on you out there, so, you know. Yeah, that's the so, that's the real secret that uh, most people will want to deny until the cows come home. Is it okay if I read out an article from the the, the Telegraph newspaper? That'd be wonderful. Yeah, this was from uh, the the Daily Telegraph, and it's titled "Brain Downloads Will Make Lessons Pointless." Children will learn by downloading information directly into their brains within 30 years. The head of British uh, Britain's top private schools organisation has predicted. This article, article came out in uh, June 2008. Chris Parry, the new chief executive of the Independent Schools Council, said matrix-style technology would render traditional lessons obsolete. He told the... Times Educational Supplement, it's a very short route from wireless technology to actually getting the electrical connections into the, your brain to absorb that knowledge. Mr. Parry, a former Rear Admiral, spent three years determining the future strategic context for the military in a senior role at the Ministry of Defence. He is now preparing the ISC's 1,300 private schools which collectively teach half a million children for a high-tech future. He told the, T, the TES that the Keanu Reeves thriller may not look like science fiction in 30 years' time, 
within 30 years, sitting down and learning something will be a thing of the past, Mr. Parry said. I think people will be able to directly access matrix style all the vocabulary you need for a foreign language, leaving you just to clear up the grammar. And uh, that's the end of the article. Man, that's something else. Again, uh, well, we see a military official there telling you how schools are going to operate. So we see the connection to the military and uh, public education system. And we also see the Matrix movie culture creation again being used like, oh, it's the Matrix. So we see the use of these films pop up and with the Matrix specifically is a big one because there's another similar article that came out recently about an artificial memory chip, which is just another brain chip that stores memories. Uh, The title of the article was The Matrix Reality uh, Artificial Memory Chip. So they use the Matrix reference again. So over and over, they use the same culture creation to uh, further their agenda because that's what what it's there for. Yeah. And, um, I mean, if anyone was ever any doubt about about what what's going on here i mean that article was about um a a military guy a rear admiral um, basically teaching children that brain chips are going to be a thing of the future and they better get used to it and it's a really cool thing okay so i mean (laughs) yeah yeah, that that says it all right there yeah yeah yeah, it does high military (laughs) official just telling you that there you go this is it yeah that's right i mean you know there's culture creation, and we sort of talked about that a bit in the first hour, and we've we've touched on it a bit um, in the second hour as well. Um, it's something we could really, really spend a lot of time on because it goes so deep and it, and it relates to so many other areas. Um, but I mean, when, when something like that happens, when you've got an admiral, a military admiral, <laughs> um, going to schools and teaching kids that um, you know they'll basically be living inside the matrix, and it'll be really cool. I mean. You don't even need culture creation, really, do you? <laughs> no, that, 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 that tells you everything. They're, they're coming yeah. out in the open and telling you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And because of the amount of marketing that's being done on this um, through all these different types of movies, I mean, that's not even going to be seen by the public as something that's necessarily like an evil or bad thing because it's like, well, you know, he's a, he's a high-standing member of society. You know, he, yes. he came yeah, and that's what was going to happen. So. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, I mean, it's, he said it's good. He's an expert, so we should trust him. Well, let's go for this, you know? Very good observation because he automatically gets a free pass because he's a high military official. And we're trained from birth to worship such people. We, we literally worship people that are with high up, high rank within the system because belief in the system as it is is a religion. And it always has been. That's how you... That's how you keep the wheel moving. And um, the the real question is why are we not why are we not allowed basically to question some somebody like that? Why? How does somebody get a free pass to basically be a god walking around on Earth and everybody just just loves them and looks up to them no matter what they say? Like what kind of what kind of world are we living in? You know what I mean? Maybe we should. Uh, be able to question anybody without uh without fear of of uh being chastised for it like oh you can't say that because he's a good person we've been trained to we've been trained to accept the authority figure you know and because this guy's a rear admiral um well he's the expert so he must know what he's talking about um there's actually another quote here um which scott's going to read out along the same lines yeah the 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 same uh, the same person the Chris Parry, who's a, a rear admiral, um, he, he was involved in um, doing the, 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 the document. It was shown in the, the, the Guardian uh, newspaper, um, but this is a quote from the... It's called the, the DCDC Global Strategic Trends Programme, yeah. 2007 to 2036. And the, the DCDC is the... I think it's uh, the, the Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre. That's right. Yeah. And they're like a sort of a think tank for um, the UK, but I think it also spans to NATO as well. Hmm. Um, but this is titled uh, Broadcast to the Brain. Hmm. It says, by 2035, an implantable information chip could be developed. I like the way they say could be. <laughs> yeah, um, could be. Could be developed and wired directly to the user's brain. 
information and entertainment choices would be accessible through cognition. I can't even say that word. Cognition. Yeah, cognition. <laughs> <laughs> and might include synthetic sensory perception beamed direct to the user's senses. Wider related ICT developments might include the invention of synthetic telepathy, including mind-to-mind or telepathic dialogue. This type of development would have obvious military and security, as well as control, legal and ethical implications. End of quote. Yeah, so many issues there. Uh, <laughs> where do you even start on that one? That's, yeah, where do you that's start? Everything. That's everything all in one. It's literal mind control for one. It's beaming synthetic sensory perception to your brain. That's uh, just basically implanting a false reality directly in there. And, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. once it's a false reality in there, I mean, what's what's the difference between that and the real one? You don't know anymore. And frankly, most people probably wouldn't care, you know? No, no, they wouldn't. And it, it, um, this is this is the scary thing. Because of the technological society um, that we've created in the last, well, mainly the last century, um, and because of the amount of culture creation um, around technology, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't care. And um, it, it reminds me of the, the quote from... Um, uh, Ke- Kevin Warwick um, that you featured in your film um, where he's basically talking about how in the Matrix um, he thinks that Neo is basically a bit of a party pooper um, <laughs> and he says that hey well um, you know if I can have um, a machine tell my brain that I'm happy that I'm satisfied um, it can give me all these cool sensory experiences um, and it can give me um, all, all the sensation and satiation I could ever want then, then hey, why would I? Why, why would anybody not want that? You know, what, yeah. what's wrong with that? You know, yeah. and so it really goes to show this kind of um, this this sign, this absolutely left brain scientific view of the world that's been promoted um, through um, all this technological propaganda and through these these transhumanists, and a lot of that is, is obviously rubbed off into the public as it was designed to. So. You know, people will read quotes like that and go, oh, well, okay, cool. I mean, I can, I can probably have, um, you know, I can be a muscle man in virtual reality. I can have the, the chip tell me that, um, that I'm, you know, Superman, that I'm flying or what have you. And, you know, um, and kids are going to be going to be loving that, aren't they? Yeah, totally. And again, the synthetic telepathy issue pops up again because we yep. see here in the strategic trends report, they're saying, oh, yeah, synthetic telepathy. That's what these uh, chips will, one of the things they'll be able to create. And you were mentioning Kevin Warwick. He is a big pr- proponent of this exact concept. He's always saying, oh, yeah, we're, language is just crap anyway. Like, it's not good enough. We're, we're going to be able to make synthetic uh, telepathy so that people can con- contact each other brain to brain and really communicate uh, in a deeper sense. And so, so he's... He's a front man again, and he's always hitting uh, specific points. And you notice this because you see multiple interviews with him, and he says the same things over and over and over and over and over and over again. So he's got specific points that he has to hit. Synthetic telepathy is obviously a big one, and um, we see it in this report. And I've also done a piece on the Georgia Guidestones where they talk about the creation of uh, the creators of the Georgia Guidestones knew about this too. And um, they talked about creating a living new language. That's like the third, I think that's the third um, thing on their, on the actual guide stones. It says create a living new language. And in their book, or, or the, the, the guys who actually uh, commissioned the monument, they wrote a letter basically saying why they did it. <laughs> that's quite a letter. But they uh, mentioned that um, academics and scientists should develop a living new language that will connect humans and machines they say that specifically so we see this synthetic telepathy idea pop up and oh all over the place and uh again connect the dots because it's all the same thing all these different areas they're all they're all connected it's all the same project yeah and also when you're talking about that it also makes me think about um uh uh, where, where does uh, privacy come into this as well? Because uh, when you're talking about telepathy, and we, we know we're moving into a surveillance uh, sort of society as well, so w- w- it seems to be all sort of blurring together. You know, where, where does it stop? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. It's, it's not just now it's not the data mining of your activity online. And from that, trying to extrapolate what somebody was thinking, what they're doing, a psychological profile, because that's what's happening right now. Uh, it's going further and actually taking the raw uh, data directly from your mind with, with a chip that's embedded in your mind, getting the raw data and having that on hand. We're like, oh, now, now we really understand our motives and motivations and understand everything. And again, uh, <laughs> It's in the name of safety and security for looking for those dangerous types of individuals and deviant thoughts, and that's another way it'll be sold and safety. But, yeah, privacy out the window. That's well known. That sort of ties into pre-crime as well. Yep. Yes, it does. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole, that, that, that's a whole uh, hour's topic in itself. Yeah, pre-crime. Yeah, definitely. Um uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's definitely the the direction we're going is in uh, law enforcement taking on a whole different role. It, it totally changing what law enforcement actually is, um, sort of getting it to be. Uh, well, again, it's the 1984 idea of the thought police where you can't even think of something wrong. Otherwise, you will be punished. And when you get people who are afraid to think in a certain way, then the effect on behavior is uh, profound. And you get people basically turning schizophrenic because they're trying to control their own thoughts so that they don't have bad negative thoughts. And uh, George Orwell's fiction is becoming reality, as we can see, because he always knew that that's the direction that um, the establishment was going. And they actually wanted that to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you can, um, if you can um, elicit um, some kind of negative emotion or some kind of pain to do, um, or something something uncomfortable to do with certain types of thoughts, then the individuals actually start to self censor those, and they, as you say. I mean, schizophrenia is obviously a big part of that, but they will, they just won't think them anymore. You know, those thoughts will be, will be basically um, eliminated through, through that process. And that's the whole idea. I mean, I think um, Dr. Jose Delgado actually made a statement about this, how they would basically implant electrodes um, under the scalp of children um, at a very early age. Now, this is ideally speaking, of course, and it's probably something that's going to happen as well, but um, they would implant these electrodes um, under the scalp of, of children uh, at a very early age, and these electrodes would be connected to the brain. And through their neuroscience, they would be able to understand what um, you know what specific thoughts could be eliminated um, through the delivery of a small shock to the brain um, whenever the child basically thought that. So. Um, there would actually be implanting technology um, into, ch- into children that would prevent them from thinking certain thoughts because basically if they're growing up with something attached to their head which gives them a small electric shock, and it may even be on a subconscious level, but it's enough to um, you know, sort of um, give them um, some kind of discomfort, then their, their cognitive patterns are, are literally being designed from the ground up so they never actually have the chance to develop their minds, they're, they're, they're being um, kind of, it's kind of like being whipped from a really young age into behaving the right way, but through this, um, th- through these brain chips, you know? Yeah. It's, and that's, that's a really scary thing. It's really, really dark, you know? Very dark. It's the perfect evolution of the twisted education system we have now, where uh, yeah. the ideal they talk about is instantly downloading information. Like, well, what does that even mean to begin with? Like, you're just throwing a bunch of data into the mind uh, that that's uh, it's totally negating the idea of critically analyzing that data it's just the consumption of massive amounts of data like that is the ideal like the more we put in there the more smarter we are you know that's based and that's really idiotic when it comes down to it that's not what intelligence is it's not just like throwing a bunch of so-called facts up and like Oh, I I have more facts stored on my internal hard drive than you do. This is it becomes like a stupid contest of like numbers. It becomes a numbers game, and this ties into the effect that technology has had on us and how we view ourselves again cybernetically 
as technology. We're like, oh, yeah, we have to be bigger. We have to be more. We just have to throw more in there. It's not about, oh, we have to understand what we are. We have to understand the world that we live in, like, uh, in a deep, rich, uh, profound kind of way that, and again, this, it's about interconnectivity and how things link together. It's not about that. It's just about acquiring the most, the, the acquiring. It's just about becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And when reality, that's a flawed model to begin with. Mm -hmm. I was thinking there of an article that I saw in the, the, the mainstream newspaper. I can't remember what newspaper it was, but um, it was talking about um, using electrodes in the brain to do a deep uh, electrical stimulation um, where you could alter the, the chemicals in the brain and you, you could make... Um, it, it could be used in depression to, to help someone... Um, um, to, to alleviate the depression and uh, to make them happier. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, that that, that could be used um, with everyone. It'd be almost like a brave new world where you, you use a uh, soma. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so if you felt uh, sort of dark thoughts, you, you could uh, stimulate your your own uh, brain chemistry to um, to be happy again. Mm -hmm. So I mean that there could be many functions for for that sort of uh, application. That's a that's a key aspect of the transhuman project as well is paradise engineering. Those are the terms that they use. One of the co-founders of the World Transhumanist Association, David Pierce, is the big proponent of this philosophy of paradise engineering, where they see it's uh, our moral imperative to delete all forms of pain and to multiply all pleasure and totally delete all painful emotions, painful, uh, anything that, that hurts when <laughs> in reality, that is incredibly dangerous because what pain and suffering and even emotion, uh, so-called negative emotions were labeled as negative. These, all these are, are just, signals telling us that something is wrong and that we have to change something so um by effectively blocking out these signals that are telling us oh look, look we have a problem uh, here maybe you should go about changing it the transhumanist idea is to just uh, block out that feed basically so, so that we can no longer uh, understand that something wrong may even be happening to begin with. We just we're totally uh, we're we're happy and we're content with everything, and that's just uh, empty, vacuous pleasure is the ideal. Like oh, it, and how could you be against that? It's good. Like it's just it's just so ridiculous. They actually heavily promote these ideas, and and, and they write pieces on Brave New World saying like oh well most critic most people who talk about Brave New World got all wrong like oh. The, this is what we think, and the, the deletion of uh, the deletion of all things negative is what we need to do, and it's our moral imperative to actually do so. If we don't doing it, do that, then we're doing a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so easy to take these ideas from minorities and, and bring it more into the mainstream and, and normalize it. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah, but there's so many. I can think of so many different applications. Um, I mean, I've seen so many articles on this sort of thing, and the, uh, I mean, there's so many directions it could go in. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and that's again, that's where science fiction comes in. Science fiction has explored all the, well, some of the directions that this could go in. And with Huxley's Brave New World, it was a warning of sorts, saying, "Hey, look, yeah, this is what will happen if uh, things continue the way that they're going." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, and I think aside, well, not aside, but along with um, along with all the this kind of positive promotion that we're seeing, um, like all these new art, news articles and all the movies, um, you know, all the science fiction that's been around for some time now. Um, there's also another side to this, and that is the <clears throat> necessity of doing this, um, and and this is where transhumanism ties into so many other things like the green agenda as well um, now <clears throat> a perfect example of this is how kids uh, are now being raised in line with the, the global warming narrative um, and the whole carbon neutral thing um, to believe that basically 
they are, well, humanity is a virus on the planet, a cancer, um, and we must all be carbon neutral, you know, and basically our very existence um, is a problem, you know, and um, so when, when you tie that into the, the whole carbon neutral thing and you, and you look at how kids are being told that, you know, basically if they're switching a light on for more than 30 seconds, they're killing a polar bear and Antarctica, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the whole idea of getting technology implanted into the brain um, and into other areas of the body so that it's powered from your own body, um, that, that, that's being promoted as something that's actually necessary. So people are being led to believe that not only is this um, uh, a positive thing, um, but it's actually completely necessary. And um, there's, there's an article here from the Mail Online, um, which I'm just going to read out. Um, the title is, um, We've Got You Under Your Skin, um, Battery-Free Surveillance Device That Can Be Planted Under the Flesh. So it says, A new generation of battery-free surveillance devices which can be implanted under the skin and transmit over huge distances via wireless have been developed by scientists. Researchers who are working on nanomachines that could be injected into the arms of patients and then report back, sorry, report back to doctors who are monitoring them from miles away. So there's also a, um, a medical tie-in there as well. Um, they would be powered by the motion of a person walking or even the pulse of a blood vessel. So it would never stop working until the person died. And, of course, that's, that's eco-friendly. So that's just an example of a device that's being promoted as the new normal. Um, obviously, there's plenty of justifications and things like that um, for, for security and, and keeping control of those damn terrorists and, and whatnot. Um, so it's not going to endure. I'll, I'll be right back. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. So we're back after a minor technical um, hiccup. And um, we were just talking about um, how certain technologies are being promoted in the mainstream media and news articles, um, how they're being justified. And I was in the middle of uh, reading an article um, in the Daily Mail. Now, I'm just going to continue reading this um, because it says that this type of technology could also be used in CCTV cameras attached to small flying craft, which use their own motion to power themselves. Such devices could be used by hospitals to locate patients or perhaps check if they're following their treatment plan. So again, it's focusing on vulnerable people and, you know, how can we argue with that? Mm -hmm. um, but they will also be of interest to the military and the criminal justice system, which is constantly on the lookout for new ways to spy on criminals. Keyword being spy. Mm -hmm. The advancements were reported in the journal Nano Letters by... Zhong Lin Wang of Georgia Tech University in the US. He said, it is entirely possible to drive the devices by scavenging energy from sources in the environment, such as gentle airflow, vibration, sonic wave, solar, chemical, and or thermal energy, he said. So again, this ties into the, the whole green agenda <laughs> where people are being trained that, uh, to think that um, you know, we can't be using any power um, you know, we've, we've, we've got to, we've got to um, have devices that, that run off ourselves, that run off our own bodies. You know, we, we are the battery. We can't be burning things. We can't be um, using resources, you know. So it's, it's not just um, being marketed as a positive thing. It's being marketed as something that's absolutely necessary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing connection right there because you get these little pizza electric devices that we're powering and that are spying on us. And in a way, you get to justify the spying through simply labeling it as a green technology and a solution like, oh, look, we can make these things that are powered off our own bodies. Like, that means that we could uh, get energy uh, in other ways for other technologies. So that's one way you kind of like offset and throw off your um, critical analysis of this story just by uh, calling it green from the get go. But uh, at, at the same time, yeah, this is um, fundamentally about placing devices in our bodies that <laughs> monitor us. And uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the health tie-in is, is huge there because um, in a world where uh, we do have these sort of devices monitoring our critical systems at all times, again, the health industry itself becomes a part of that 
larger system that offers safety and security because you need these things embedded in you to be safe because like if you don't have your critical systems being monitored at all time we'll go oh no you could have a heart attack who knows what'll happen like some sort of some sort of uh health disaster could happen and you'd be left helpless because nobody'd be monitoring you so again ties in the health system with the whole security state with uh, monitoring everything everybody does with the green agenda <laughs> with, with transhumanism it's again we see uh, the connections between everything yeah yeah it's it really is incredible when you when you look at how how many of these different agendas all are all feeding into the same place so they're all basically heading in the same direction and um something that um is is come up um with me when when I'm looking at um, how the stuff's being popularized to the public, and you've got so many different demographics in the public. You've got people who are into certain interests and certain sort of um, causes, certain groups, and certain sort of political ideologies and those kinds of things. And uh, transhumanism is always marketed to them in, in the right way for them. You know, it, it always appeals to to the right demographics in the right way. And um, I think the Zeitgeist movement um, and the Venus Project are, are a classic example of this, because although they don't allude to transhumanism directly in their public um, work, for the most part, anyway, you know, not in their films and, and things like that. Um, if you listen to what Jacques Fresco and Peter Joseph are actually saying, um, then they they are actually talking. Um, about transhumanism, you know, they're talking about the, the need for man and machine to merge um, to first of all get rid of all these useless, troublesome emotions, and second of all to save the environment. And people who are familiar with uh, the Venus Project uh, and the work of the Zeitgeist movement will know that um, their sort of fundamental premise is that um, the world needs to be centralized um, into a, a planetary regime. Um, that is run on basically an AI supercomputer. Um, it would be a resource-based economy where you've got some kind of AI that is deciding what needs to be done, you know, um, water over here, food over there, you know, upgrades and maintenance over here. Um, so th there's a huge amount of these kinds of ideas that are permeating um, what is becoming um, a, a really popular kind of alternative culture. Um, but when you actually look um, at, where, at, at where they're going and, and the kind of things that they're saying and um, most especially the kind of um, philosophies um, that they're continuing on, um, it's, it's really not an alternative agenda at all, is it? Yeah, well, there you have it. It's the uh, promotion of the establishment's agenda through um, the label, the convenient label of anti-establishment it's saying that um it's the tapping into youthful rebellion which is constant just a, a fact of human life uh, youths rebel and they start questioning things so uh what you do is you take advantage of that as with all other natural uh traits of human life <laughs> and um you tap into that rebellion and you get you actually repackage your ideas and when i'm saying you are I'm, I'm talking generically as the establishment i think which i think we've pretty well outlined what the establishment is on this broadcast you um the establishment's agendas you need to package them in a way that actually appears to be anti-establishment and yeah if we're looking at this idea of a centralized system for goodness sake run by an artificial intelligence machine and this is the ideal to shoot for it's it's the actual promotion of a scientific technocracy yeah. again through can counter cultural uh, channels and specifically with the zeitgeist movement i've noticed the theme of they use the same meme of humans are terrible and we're just going to destroy ourselves anyway if we don't do this we need this uh intelligent system to do it for us like they play on that meme that which is yeah. one of the most critical memes that ties to transhumanism that makes the transhumanism uh, agenda that how how it's sold the meme being that humans are inherently flawed they're evil they're going to destroy the planet they're terrible uh 
Therefore, we need to remake humanity or completely replace humanity with something better. And, well, there it is. There's artificial intelligence would be the replacement or a transhumanized post-human creation would be the improvement over that horrible, horrible humanity. So this is a self-destructive ideology that is being broadcast, as you say, to many different demographics. It's not just the anti-establishment countercultural youthful rebellion demographic it's every single demographic you'd think of you know you got wired magazine you've got uh forbes magazine for like the 50 year old businessman uh, you, you've got all these different channels for different demographic different different demographics saying the same pr stories again to bring it back to the pr stories are carbon copies same ideas same memes pumped out in these these different demographics and that's how the agenda rolls on yeah, yeah. And you can see that through the promotion of these ideas and there's so many different demographics in so many different ways ensures that the the culture that they're creating, um, um, it, it's just like, it's a saturated culture. It's, it's absolutely, it's wall to wall, you know, that they're, well, when they're promoting these ideas through so many different areas, there can be no escape from it because it, it has be, it's promoted as normal and it becomes the new norm in every area of life. So there's nowhere to run, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. And at the same time, we're all thinking in our silly little clicky mentalities because that's what they've got us locked into. But we're yeah. like, I am a businessman and I have nothing to do with counter-cultural ideas. I am the establishment. Well, no, maybe you better rethink that idea because your ideas are the exact same ideas as the anti-establishment movement. And likewise, you could take that same argument in reverse. So you, uh, we're, we're thinking so generically, and, and we're, we're actually divided to a great extent and united at the same time. So we, we get this false sense of division as if, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, my viewpoint is right on the world, and I'm so much smart. We, we all think we're so smart. We all think we, we know everything, and like our stupid little opinions are like the epitome of truth. When in reality, our opinions are sold to us through public relations propaganda. Uh, read Edward Bernays. He, could, he goes on and on about this. and uh, So that's the reality. Our opinions are given to us, and they all line up perfectly. Supposed contra- contradicting views are actually the exact same views, and they all lead to the same agenda. And it behooves every single one of us to... Uh, ego check ourselves and be like, no, wait a minute. Maybe I, my little opinion about the world is not completely correct. Maybe I don't know everything like I've been told and convinced myself that I do. Maybe I should stop being a control freak in my little corner of the world and think that I... It's, it's ridiculous. We, we've all become control freak maniacs. And at the same time, we don't know... We don't even know what we're doing. We're, yeah. we're, we're out of control. And we, we need to just stop and be like, okay... Time to be sensible, time to uh, just uh, actually uh, reflect on ourselves, uh, actually yeah. tear ourselves apart and be like, okay, you know, I, I was wrong about something. If yeah, we can do that. that. <laughs> observe without the ego. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, just one more thing on, on what you were saying about um, how, you know, everyone thinks that they've really got, um, you know, sort of these original ideas about things and... Okay. Um, no, it's it's superior to all others. Um, it's it's interesting because um, you can even see that in, in the kind of ideas that the Zeitgeist Movement and Venus Project are promoting. Because you know these guys are talking about. I mean, not not public, not so much in their films, but in their kind of private lectures, they talk about how um, the family unit is basically it's outmoded. It's no longer needed. How children are uh, a pain a pain in the ass, as I quote <laughs> Fresco. You know, yeah. um, and and he talks about how. Uh, individuality is basically a corrosive force that needs to be, you know, stripped out of society. Um, you know, so you look, you look at these kind of ideas, and um, this is the exact same thing as, as Huxley was talking about in Brave New World. You know, mm-hmm. so th- these people have grown up with the uh, the kind of literature, um, not even knowing what it really was, and, and having taken on those ideas themselves when they've just they've basically just been indoctrinated from the people before them. You know. And now they're passing it down to us. So, yeah. Self-destruction. That's what it is. That's what all this is. We're, we're, we're being convinced that we need to destroy ourselves. And uh, if you think that's a good idea, go down that road. I, I happen to not think it's good. And I think that we should start asking questions of these wonderful leaders that pop up here and there in, in the world. Maybe we should start questioning them and 
that that yeah. that'd be a good goal. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in tying in with destruction and with self destruction, that there's kind of a, a much bigger thing going coming well going on here, isn't there? there? There's something much bigger and much more arcane and kind of esoteric that we're all being drawn into. And um, you've gone into this in your book, Revolve, um, in, in quite a lot of detail. And it's something I, I'd like to talk about because it, it's really important um, to be able to take this step back from all the details and kind of zoom out a little bit and look at the overall process that's, come, that's um, coming to fruition here. And, and it, it's basically an alchemical thing, isn't it? Where if you look at ha what's happening in the world in, in so many areas with, with politics, with geopolitics with um, economics and, and finance, um, um, with, with media, with technology, with so many different areas, everything's kind of being pushed into this revolutionary state where it's, it's kind of like this Armageddon end times programming where everything is just being pushed to its absolute limits so that it can crumble and then the new, the new world can be born out of that. Um, this this new collective hive mind, you know, um, with a technological man, you know, man is machine, um, and that that's an alchemical um, process, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, again, self destruction, as we were saying, and it indeed is an alchemical process. This is something that mystifies many people when you say it, because that's the nature of alchemy. It is mysticism. It's the actual practical application of the ancient mystic tradition. That's all that alchemy really is. I mean, so many people like to pretend like it's this purely spiritual enlightenment thing for bettering yourself, which at one level, that's exactly what it is. But at another level, we're talking about the macrocosmic building of uh, a utopian civilization in one in one sense that's uh, one of the goals but um, in another sense it's it's always been about apotheosis uh, man's rise to godhood and that's what my book revolve man's scientific rise to godhood is is about fundamentally is about this process that we are living through that we are uh contributing to unconsciously for the most part but now some of us are becoming consciously aware of what's happening uh of our own place in what they call um the initiates of the ancient mysteries their great work they call it the great work and uh, like i was saying uh, most of us are unconscious that when we go to work every day we're actually doing our little contribution to the great work and mm. when we're not conscious of what we've actually been building up to, uh, if, if it's an unconscious process on our part, uh, once the lead of alchemy is turned into gold, it will be a perfected version of, it'll be the perfect version of the process itself. And the process, this is getting kind of convoluted, but what, what I'm meaning to say is that uh, our unconsciousness will become a perfected unconsciousness. And this is the enslavement of the transhumanist agenda that could very likely happen if we do uh, alchemically perfect uh, ourselves, uh, ourselves being unconscious slaves, if that's, if that's indeed what we are. I, I, I'm not saying that that's what we have to be or that's what we are. That's what we could be if we never take a moment's uh, time to think about what it is that we're doing we are unconscious automatons and we will perfect ourselves if that's what we really want to do um i'm saying that maybe not all of us want to go that way and uh, maybe by throwing um a stick in the spokes of this wheel that's revolving the revolution the the wheel spinning around Maybe just throwing a little stick from a tree that we pick up off the ground will stop the revolution. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting that you brought up the great work because um, people involved in the truth movement will know that, um, you know, um, <clears throat> Freemasonry is, is, a, is a very important part of this because um, the, the rites and rituals uh, and the symbols of Freemasonry are something that really do permeate to the, um, the upper levels of the pyramid. 
Um, and, um, you know, we, we do know that uh, many of these very powerful people um, who are behind governments and behind corporations are indeed Freemasons. Um, so th there's much larger, uh, much more arcane thing going on here. Um, and this really does stretch back um, hundreds, if not thousands of years um, when we're talking about the great work. Yeah. Um, and as you say um, on the front of your book, this, this is about man becoming God, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but what I was going to mention is that um, obviously w the, with the, the way that the world currently is, um, we're not treated very well by these people, are we? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, they don't have a very high opinion of us. So when, when they're talking about their great work and, and bringing man up to the level of God and, and basically creating man as machine, um, and you know there, there are many different ways you can interpret that. Um, is it, is it also going to be them that, that will be ad adapting and changing with this technology as well? Or is this technology just for us? Is the, is the great work, is that just for us? Well, that's, uh, that's a wonderful question. And yes, uh, what, kind of, what kind of godhood is it that we're all creating? And, and whose who's godhood? And yeah, what, what, what has been our function all along? As you say, we, we're treated basically have been treated for hundreds if not thousands of years as animals and basically we're uh, animals on a farm to be uh, used for profit and for um, feeding for, 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 so uh, people and, and we get so many people denying this fact that there is such a thing as a predatory class of uh, a, a small predatory class of human beings that do indeed see other human beings as animals, lower animals, and they see themselves as truly evolved human beings, and therefore, you know, they uh, they set up their system where, okay, well, if they're the animals and I'm the human, well, I'm going to, if they're going to act like animals, I'm going to treat them as such. And this is really, again, gets back to the eugenic ideology, and it, it, this is where eugenics has come from. It's just this, this point of reference this frame of mind which is very much a real thing in our world and it's playing out and the transhuman uh project has very much to do with this uh, and, and and it's it's so hard to get people to accept this truth because for for one thing they don't want to believe that anybody would be that evil but for another thing they don't want to think that we're actually in that and that much of trouble that the situation is that dire but it is but at the same time like we can do something about it. it's 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 never hopeless we always have the power to do amazing things and the agenda rolls on by disempowering us again and that this um self-destruction so the answer is self-empowerment and turning things around on uh those who would weaken us yeah, it's very, it's very interesting what you're saying there. Um, it makes me think of that book um, by Charles Galton Darwin, the, the Next Million Years. In the, in the book, he, he talks about how um, the, the establishment at the top have to maintain their own self-preservation and the, the, uh, their own survival mechanisms um, because they will be the people that are going to steer the ship or steer planet Earth. And um, so the, the public at the bottom don't really need their survival mechanisms because they, they'll be well managed at the bottom level. Mm -hmm. And they willingly give up their survival mechanisms in the name of convenience anyway. So that yeah. it's, it works on so many levels. Like they, they, actually, uh, they actually feel like they have the permission to do this because we willingly give up so much of our own powers that that's um apparent proof that we don't uh we're, we're accepting our place as just a lower animal and um a disempowered creature and that, that's where we belong so it's a really uh sick relationship that should not go on and we, we need a <laughs> what we need is a macrocosmic version of a relationship therapy here mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that, that's why it's so interesting to talk about the differences between individuality and the, the, the collective. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, because with collectives, too, it's important to study group psychology. And you'll notice uh, 
with group psychology, it's it's anything but rational. It's just uh, y- you can create any ideology, and um, if t- any one person that is an adherent of a cult of any sort will have to bend their own ideas about the world and even themselves and the way they act to the uh, to the ideology of the cult. And so, and so uh, group psychology is very important and is actually taken advantage of, again, by uh, scientific behaviorists that um, employ propaganda to uh, get us to act in certain ways and to, to get us to actually delude ourselves into thinking that the world is a certain way when that's, uh, well, if it's not utter nonsense, it's just kind of a smoke screen to get us from thinking about uh, the full scope of things so that we're not thinking deep, just a bunch of smoke screens. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, it, it really does beg the question, um, what, what kind of information and, and do, do people really need um, to, to, to be confronted with before they'll, they'll really get um, you know, a, a reasonable idea of, of what this, this great plan is or this great work is because mm-hmm. I mean, the, their whole idea is, is basically a globe um, full of people. Um, obviously, the, the population would be vastly reduced and um, a, a whole group full of, of people basically operating in a hive mentality, you know, and we, we're talking the bog here, you know. Yeah. You know, each person would be assigned duties and maintenance and, and roles, and you'd have, it would be like Brave New World, you'd have al- alphas and betas and, um, and gammas and epsilons, and mm. uh, I mean, this, this is their great work, you know, this is, this is what they have in mind. I mean, these, these guys aren't messing around, you know, yeah. and um, so it, it sort of it's it's interesting and and when you think about um you know what needs to be done to kind of communicate that this this very real reality to people um so that they are able to to kind of cut through all the different um ideologies that have been given because i mean the science fiction's out there i mean the books are out there the movies are out there but it's always delivered in a right brain way and people can just kind of dismiss it as being oh you know that's just science fiction you know and so it's it's kind of a difficult thing isn't it yeah, because there really is a uh, higher context here that scares uh, scares everybody to death. And um, that reality is that <laughs> we really don't know everything and that we are, uh, there is a very real hidden aspect to everything in our life. And, and we're, we're not really willing to give up the false sense of security that's given to us by so many false gods in this world, uh, government, um, religions, or whoever, an individual giving us an ideology, that's all false senses of security. We're, we're, we're not confident enough, unfortunately, at this point in time, to say, hey, you know what, uh, these authorities are no such authority, and um, they're actually getting... The whole goal here is getting me disempowered so that I don't actually think twice about what it is I'm doing, and that I, there's actually a higher aspect to my existence. And, and and this this is what sort of in a way it transcends the information that we have to relay to people because I mean we're doing a good thing by putting out the real uh, hard evidence of what we're talking about, but in a way like people don't want to listen they listen to it because they can just dismiss it. What it takes is an individual person like realizing like it, it goes it goes beyond information itself. It's like an individual choice, and it comes down to the existence of free will, which is an interesting topic. We've all been convinced that free will is well, it's debatable, and there's no such thing really. I mean, you can say that there is or there isn't. Well, the way it comes down to it is: are people ready and prepared to accept? the responsibility of free will and everything that comes with that uh and if they are then we can uh, we can really do things but it, again that's that's an individual choice and the destruction of the individual is well underway with this technological nightmare that's being built but um it it fundamentally comes down to free will as our ultimate gift that we need to uh, stand up in defending it, and we each have our own uh, we, we have to do that all on our own unfortunately so you can't really make anybody do it 
Yeah, that's right, because there's so much going around that's to do with collectivism in some way or another. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's all about the we, the us, and the our, you know, and we, we need to do this, and they need to do that, and we need to group together, and need to get more people, and we need to, you know, join parties, and we need to wave flags and hold signs up, and, um, you know, this is just getting, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to take away the, the power of some of these things, but this is basically getting um, people more into groupthink and, and, and taking them away from their own individual core and people finding their own individual core and really kind of cutting through all the different ideologies and ideas and cultures that have been thrown at them to buy. Um, that, that is the, really, it's the only real solution to this, isn't it? Um, because only a true individual who really knows themselves is going to be someone who's going to be immune to the kind of propaganda and the kind of sort of this Orwellian trickery that they use to, to sucker people into the various agendas. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough thing to do that, but uh, it's a worthwhile thing to do at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, we've talked for an hour and a half now. Um, we've covered a lot of subjects. I think it might be about time to round things up. Um, now, for people who are interested in hearing more, Aaron does a lot of work on this kind of thing. Um, obviously, he has the film, Age of Transitions. He has the book, Revolve. Um, and he's done a number of podcasts, which are up available on his website, um, theageoftransitions.com. And I believe you're also doing a series at the moment on the, the symbolic sort of meaning of all this and, and the kind of stuff we've just been talking about recently, Aaron. Yeah, that's right. I'm doing a series of podcasts specifically about the ancient mysteries and how uh, the symbolism of the mysteries is actually uh, it fits into what we're talking about here with transhumanism and it's actually always been about um, a practical method of getting people to do certain things, a practical method of mind control basically so it's uh, my interpretation of the many and varied symbols of uh, the mysteries and it will be a long long series and I hope it, uh, people will find it valuable and I will also be encouraging people to take the podcasts and uh, share them with others and do what they want with them maybe making videos of them or whatever so this is a this is a group effort and I'm putting this info out there and I hope people will take it and run with it yeah yeah well we thank you for the work you've done. Um, obviously, the, the, your work's been greatly informative and educational for both for both me and Scott, and um, it's, it's been really great to have you on the show. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, and it's, um, it's been a great conversation. We've really covered a lot, and um, I just hope that um, the people will be able to take the next step from this and start researching these things on their own. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I, I very Listen, much yeah, appreciate it. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thanks again. Adam, it's good speaking to you. We'll, we'll definitely do it again sometime. Cool, sounds good.